Well, I'm sitting here with uh, Zach Schmoll and Carla Alvarez, and Zach is uh, Zach and I. We we just met, you know, <laughs> uh, probably about ten minutes ago. We've we've you know dabbled some online, and I've talked to you some there. And Carla and I, you know, we go to school here at HBU together, and Zach's a graduate at HBU, and uh, so. I wanted to pull you guys together. Zach, you know, you've uh, been the, the managing editor of the Unexpected Journal, and I know Carlos helped you some with yeah, that as well. She's a contributor. I, uh, yeah, we're just about to launch our sixth issue, so we've been doing it for about a year and a half now, and it's Amazing, awesome. yeah, yeah. Uh, we have a great team. Carlos is a huge part of what we do, and it's really exciting. Yeah. Right, all, all six, five issues, five issues, the next one's going to be six. Okay, so. great, great, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So yeah, uh, well, tell us a little bit. Uh, I guess we could start there. What What is an unexpected journal? Uh, what are you guys up to with that? What's that project look like? And and what's the state of that going forward? Uh, sure. So an unexpected journal is a quarterly publication founded by um, HBU students and graduates, and our entire purpose is to try to um, expose a broader audience to cultural and imaginative apologetics. It's a field that people don't know a lot about, but it was our specialty at HBU, and we thought this is really important. We want to help kind of give a voice to apologists who maybe um, aren't always um, as um, always as engaged, let's say, in traditional apologetic conversations. We're trying to reach a different audience than most other outlets um, in our field. So that's what we're trying to do. And we've been doing it now. Um, this is our sixth issue coming up in about a week. And it's great. We're keeping it going. Cool, cool. Now, Carla, you're a contributor to uh -huh. An Unexpected Journal. So yes. tell us what that's like uh, writing for that and uh, you know what you, what you guys do, how you, how you contribute to the journal. Well, uh... It's, it's interesting because a lot of it is, if you read the journal, especially uh, the first issue, which is on the abolition of man, which is something that every single person in the apologetics program, whether you're cultural or philosophical track, uh, we all take that class, we all read that book. So it was, it was a very um, familiar and common, common ground for us. But if you read the essays, that's basically in, in that first issue, that's basically what we do in in the program as a whole. So there are um, there are essays about, I wrote one about education, about modern education. There's another contributor, Rebecca Valerius, who wrote one from, about it on education from a different aspect. Um, there's some on the problem of evil. There's bringing in, uh, we have another one that's on kind of showing how um, the evil, the impact of evil uh, using Macbeth and so it's just taking taking truth and looking at it in a little bit different way and so maybe maybe it's something that people haven't thought of in that way and um, as Zach said we try to look reach a little bit different audience so especially this the first one is really more I'll, I'll show you this one this one was, is the first issue on the abolition of man, and it's more, it's all essays. The other ones are a little bit different. And so mm -hmm. starting with the second one, I really love this one. It's on the power of story, and it explains about how stories impact us and how they can really change your life. Like C.S. Lewis, was his story is that he was an atheist for a long period of his time until he picked up a book by an author, a Scottish author called uh, named George MacDonald, mm. and it was a fantasy, and he said, what is the quote exactly? It, it bathed his ima imagination. Yeah, yeah. And so he had come to a point where he knew he was starting to go down a dark path. Yeah. Did and you say it baptized? His baptized his imagination, yeah. yes. Yeah. And so it it changed the trajectory of his life, just this this story right and this is um this talks about this quite a bit i actually my my when my mom read this she uh just loves some of the essays in there about how important stories are not just fictional stories but our stories that god works in our life to you know impact those around us and to tell his story and she said it, it made me see how 
important these little stories that I feel like I have to write that maybe it can yeah. have an impact on other people too. So I this is kind of the the first this the abolition of man was our first issue. I kind uh-huh. of feel like this is the first one that was kind of our catching our stride and really right. kind of getting into this is what we're talking about. For example, um, there's a story in here called Dry Bones, and it was written by one of our. She's her name is Corinne Martinez. She just graduated in in May, right? It was in May, and it's um, it's actually was written in honor of Santa Fe, the community, because her 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 kids go to Santa Fe High School. It was written right after they had the school shooting, and um, and it was really. It had really had a lot of importance to her, and mm-hmm. I I think it's an awesome story. It's just yeah, it just shows sometimes things are so harsh and so too much that right. you have to step back and look at it in a story, so you can see okay maybe right. once I get past the the pain of it right now I can see that there's there's yeah. a bigger picture here. So um, there's in the other ones there's there's a mix there's there's poems there's um, there's short stories and then there's essays. Yeah. And so each of the issues has a theme. So the second one was on the power of story. The third one was on courage, hope, and heroism about how stories that that show heroes and virtue, how yeah. they can be encouraging and be those good companions about like, okay, well, how how should life go? Because a lot right. of times life doesn't go very well. Yeah. And a lot of times we make really bad choices. And so when you have a story where the hero goes through some struggles but comes through and makes some good choices, that can be an encouragement for us to make better choices ourselves. And so that was the third one. And the fourth one was a special one because it was we're rounding out our first year. And uh, it's actually on a book called Planet Narnia which was written by one of our professors, Dr. Michael Ward. And it was, uh, he had published the, his work 10 years ago. And uh, it was, in, it was our, our little journal was in honor of that, a celebration yeah. of that 10 year anniversary. So that was a lot of fun. We had a lot of outside contributors, a lot of big names and inkling scholarship came and contributed and um, in honor of Dr. Ward. And so that one's that one's a little different. Um, we have there's also it's a lot more visual in this one. Um, there's a lot of there's some photos uh, by a photographic artist, Lancia Smith, that um, sh- she allowed us to use. And then also every single every single essay in the journal has this amazing graphic created by one of our alumni. Writers. They are cool. They, the graphics are really yeah. Cool. You can just sit there and just look at them yes. for like like what what is in this so yes. it's it's been fun i mean it's just been um i don't know if that was really your question so much but no, it, that, it's just yeah that that's a good uh good response to you know i kind of want to touch back on a few things that you said carla um just so you know if you're if you're new to cultural apologetics you know we talked about that you know i started studying here at houston baptist uh, a couple years ago, and I uh, met a lot of my peers, such as you guys. And when I came here, I was told there's well, there's two tracks. There's a there's a philosophical and there's a cultural track. And uh, I think a lot of people, when it comes to apologetics or defending the faith, maybe they're more familiar with the philosophical, um, the giving reasons or rationale for your beliefs. Um, not that cultural doesn't do that, but you mentioned a lot about the need for storytelling. And the need for you know narrative, so it's one thing to present to someone who maybe is a skeptic or an atheist some logical argument to why they should believe in God, but to take those arguments and make them mean something, sort of seems to be the approach of the cultural apologist. And Zach, maybe you can speak to this some too. What what is cultural apologetics? How is it different, I guess, from philosophical apologetics? And, and what is the what is the aim or the goal of cultural apologetics? Sure. So when I think of cultural apologetics, I oftentimes think about how in our culture right now, there's a lot of times where there's not even a baseline um, of let's say biblical literacy. I mean, we have biblical literacy problems in our churches, and so the culture at large, it's even more so. And so 
when I think about cultural apologetics, I think about building bridges from the gospel truths, from the biblical truths, to our culture to help people understand, um, you know, why we believe what we believe and why it makes sense. Um, so I have to refer to it once because I refer to it in everything I ever do. But think about the Lord of the Rings. And yes. when, right, so I mean, we all know that beautiful scene. It's portrayed in the movie really well with Sam carrying Frodo up Mount Doom at the end because he can't make it himself. Now, there's a truth embedded in that. There's a truth that says, well, number one, it's good to help other people. It's good to overcome evil. It's good to you know, fight to the bitter end and give everything you have. Now, these are all very real biblical truths. Our culture sees that movie and they realize, hey, these are really good things. Like, these are good. And so our job is to help them understand why they're good. And they're good because they reflect God's truth into our world. So I think of that as the role of the apologist and, or the cultural apologist. The philosophical apologist, in my opinion, does exactly the same thing. Their arguments are very similar. The, the difference is they tend to use terminology that's a lot different. They tend to, it's more of a, it's more of an approach that's been used in more formal academic pursuits. And not to dismiss that, not to discount that. I love that, but it's not where everyone's at. And everyone doesn't resonate with that type of argumentation. So for me, I see cultural apologetics as um, a kind of a, a parallel path to help people um, get, obviously, to the gospel truth. That's what we're all here to do. Um, but on the flip side, we're helping them connect on a level that maybe, um, like, they don't want to see a logical proof. But formal logic might mean nothing to them. Right, but right. maybe seeing it portrayed on screen, they're like, oh, that makes sense to me. Um, so that's kind of how I see it's the same goal. We, we're pursuing the same truth. Uh, we're pursuing, uh, we're just using slightly different methods. And um, I, it, it actually makes me think, and I pulled this up in the, um, in our first ever issue, I kind of wrote a letter to open the first issue, the Abolition of Man one, that um, Carla held up for you. And I wrote, um, I wrote right near the end of my letter, we hope to show you by our work, inspired by the Abolition of Man, that utilizing the imagination and reason together can expose the dangerous consequences of certain popular ideas in our society of disordered desires. So again, it's the same idea. We're exposing falsehood. We're leading people to truth, just like philosophical apologists. But I think we're doing it in a slightly different way by bringing together reason and the imagination. Right. Well, that's a great. That's a great way to put it. Um, and you mentioned uh, the Lord of the Rings, and you know, I think that's that's one of the best examples. I think that that our culture, most everyone, can say they've seen the Lord of the Rings films. You know they love them, or you know most of mo most people I've met have nothing but good to say about the, the films. I mean they're they're amazing, but of course that film, uh, you know, or those films are an adaptation of the novel that you know was you know so so impactful when Tolkien wrote it. And like you said, there's so many truths embedded within the novel that. You, you don't, you know, you for some reason they still resonate with people whether they know Christ yet or not. There's something about humanity itself that, you know, we, we, we read a story or, you know, we, we hear these stories and they speak the truth that are within us that, that kind of, I, they, they kind of hit at this, this longing in us, this, you know, so, you know, Lewis talking about his imagination being baptized, you know, there, there was this, uh, outer and other experience of what he called joy that he kept you know throughout his life experiencing and it was sort of a call to him something inside of him and, and it seems like that's sort of the role of cultural apologetics there's a um in one of the the essays that we we read in the program on um, imagination george mcdonald says it doesn't so much as um it awakes a meeting yeah. You awake to it, so that it doesn't create a meaning, but you see a meaning that's already there. And 
so you can give an argument for something, but without the illustration, you might not understand exactly what that is. Yes, yes, that's a good way to put it. And we mentioned, um, we mentioned, you know, Lewis and Tolkien. I think those are probably the most well-known names. I mean, those, pe there's plenty of people who have never studied apologetics, and but yet they hear those names and they know Lord of the Rings or the Chronicles of Narnia. You know, those things speak out. Uh, big time. So, uh, are there any other names, any other cultural apologists that come to mind? Uh, is there anyone today that's you know still alive and well that you would recommend uh, anyone read, or um, is it sort of a you know because one of the things I feel like that we need now is the cultural apologist, um, and I don't know you know <laughs> who's the next in line to kind of take the mantle, and how do we even do that, you know? I think, um, so maybe it's because I don't read a whole lot of modern, um, modern fiction writers. Yeah. I, I think of, you know, I think of George MacDonald. I think he's, I, I wish more people had read him. Right. He, he actually, you know, he so influenced Lewis and, and even actually all the Inklings as mm -hmm. well. But he has, most people know his, his, uh, children's fairy tales, like the, um, the Princess and the Goblin, The Princess and Curdie, yeah. those, The North Wind. But he wrote a lot of um, adult fiction, too. Right. He, he supported himself as an author. Um, I haven't read as... I've read more of G.K. Chesterton's uh, philosophy. I've read yeah. a couple of his novels. Yeah. I actually think that just looking at movies in general, that a lot of those conversations are being had it's just not Christians are talking about them. Right. I think that Christians have, and I've, I've read some author groups where this discussion is going on, Christians think, consider a Christian story is if someone is uh, a sinner, they recognize that, and they accept Jesus. And <laughs> if it doesn't have those elements in it, they don't consider it a Christian story. Right. Where all truth... You know, if Jesus is truth, all truth is a, re is a reflection of him. And so one of the things that Dr. Ordway said in, in the conference, who is, she's one of our professors, actually one of the founding professors, she said, books aren't Christians, people are. Yes. You know, so I think I would watch things like, um, I can't remember what the name of it was. It was the uh, Superman and Batman. Right. Batman Civil War. <laughs> yeah. And I looked at... I, I only w even watched part of it, but it was like, who sets the truth? Yeah. You know, are, and so those conversations I think are being had. It's just that I think the church as a whole has really, for large part, lost the ability to really have conversations with culture. So we think if it's not in this Christian frame, right? if it doesn't have the Christian packaging, we don't recognize what that truth is. We don't right. recognize the the questions people are asking, like I have, I have an, uh, just a short blog post on, on my blog that it's about the synchronicity of God, how God works through circumstances. And that is literally like the number one post that gets visited because people see these, these occurrences that are happening to a purpose. Right. And they, they see it happening, and they want to know more about that. So yeah. people are having those conversations. They're just not using the language of the church. Yeah. And so I think we have to learn how to, to recognize what those, the stories that are being yeah. told, yeah. the truth that's in it. And sometimes you do have to pick out the thing that's, that it's not always whole truth. You have to pick out the things that aren't good and yeah. say, okay, well, this is not true, but this is, this is a good thing. And that's, that's really, um, like the, our third one on courage, strength, and hope. We have a lot of that, that in there we have, there's a lot about the movies and, and modern stories. Um, that's what this, our next issue coming out in the beginning of June, that's what it's entirely about, yeah. about yeah. music and movies and how, you know, this longing for, I mean, we can be completely corrupt and depraved to society, but people are still longing for beauty. They want yeah. that truth and the meaning. And so what what are people saying? Yeah. 
Now, I think this brings us, and Zach, you may can speak to this, but I think this brings us to another point, and that is, uh, it seems to me that maybe in the modern or postmodern era, there, there's a uh, being, you know, that being, you know, the last hundred years, there, there, there seems to be um, sort of a, you know, I'm not going to be a part of the world, so, you know, Christians are here, the world is separate type mentality that has, I guess, developed, and uh, yet, so people still have this longing, and that's why I think we see church to, church attendance decline, but people actually identifying to be spiritual and religious now, which is a strange concept, right? And yet, you see people flock to movies, like, you know, I just recently went and saw The Avengers, you know, and so these supernatural sort of stories where uh, people still have that craving for that. So how does the church recapture it? Because for a long time, the church captured people's imagination. I mean, that's what they did. So how can we recapture? Is it is it now that you? Know, I guess maybe the means has changed a bit. Uh, you know, cinema, film uh, seems to be growing in popularity. How do we recapture the imagination of the culture around us? Because we, I really do believe that we have the greatest story. This is the what you know what was Tolkien called the the, the catastrophe of man's history. We have this story. So how do we recapture imagination? Um, yeah, so I, I think it's a really interesting point because I just read a book recently by Paul Gould entitled Cultural Apologetics. And I, uh, he talks a lot about how our society seems to view the world as disenchanted, right? So as much as we love the enchantment of the movies, we go to the movies, we see the Avengers, or we see Star Wars, or we see whatever. Uh, where people have these abilities and there are these big narratives and we love following them and we love seeing it all play out. Um, in our own world, somehow we apply this um, like this two-dimensional filter to our own world. We seem to flatten our own world and make it um, like, oh, well, I love that story, but it can't happen here. It can't happen in my world. Like, my world doesn't have you know anything beyond you know, what I see and what I can touch. And, and so, um, and that kind of speaks to your point about for a long time, the uh, the church kind of captured the imagination. It brought in that extra kind of, um, that broadening of perspective and it wasn't so limiting as we find ourselves today. So I think the, um, the first step to kind of re-enchanting the world, if you will, is... I think we have to get people to think, and this is echoing the world largely, I like how we put it, is to recognize that um, Christianity is both true and satisfying. Um, and so I think the idea is that you have these desires you were talking about, people want these desires fulfilled. Um, and so they go to the movies to see that, or they read a book to see that, or um, whatever way they try to find that. They say they're spiritual but not religious. Um, they're longing for this, they're trying to find it. Um, and I think that we, as apologists, have to demonstrate to them that, you know, the truth of the gospel is what will satisfy these desires most effectively. Uh, they might get bits and pieces here and there. I mean, that's why we talk about, um, you know, for example, in our upcoming issue, I mean, we have articles about what, Ready Player One, the recent movie. We have an article about Harry Potter, The Watchmen. Uh, one, we have one about the uh, band, 21 Pilots. I mean, people are longing for these things. And they are... Um, and so I think that's the first step to re-enchanting, is getting them to realize, okay, these longings that you have may be pointing to something. Um, and it's not impossible that there's more to the world than the here and now. Um, there's a sociologist named Peter Berger, and he talks about uh, signs of transcendence. And he points towards things like order or humor or play. These are things that we have a desire for. Like, why do we care about order? We all seem to. We all seem to have this desire to, if there's a mess, we probably are going to clean it up. If, um, you know, why do we make... Um, you know, why are our cities laid out in grids, for crying out loud? We like order. We like things that make sense. Um, why is there humor? Like, why do we desire to find something funny? Why do we 
seek out experiences that make us laugh. I mean, play. Why do we sometimes just want to uh, go and just enjoy things? I mean, I went to a concert last night. Why did I go just to enjoy and listen to music? I, I don't know what I do when it's in me, and it seems to point to something that can't be measured, it can't be um, quantified, and yet um, it's very real. It's real to all of us. It seems to be a pretty general human experience, and so um, maybe it points to something that can't be measured. It can't be um, explained in the way that you know, we like to measure things. We like to find lengths and widths and heights and weights and all these other things. Um, but maybe um, it points to something that's no less real. Um, but then how do we answer that? Like how, what's the answer for that? And I think that's where cultural apologetics, or and apologetics in general, including philosophical, we can step in and say, well, okay, it makes sense. And you have these desires and maybe, you know, maybe God is the best reason for that. And then we talk through why that may be. Obviously, it's a much longer, more detailed process than that. Most people won't, um, you know, fall to their knees and convert because I tell them God's the best answer after, right, right. like, one minute. But I, I think that's the, the step to take. Yes, yes. And you, you point out something that, you know, and, and Carla, you might can speak to this, too. Uh, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase Dr. Ordway, but in, in her book, um, she she talked about you know some uh, her book uh, apologetics in the Christian imagination. She talked about how atheists will typically you know say well just because you have that inner desire doesn't mean that it's real. And she said but on the flip side I'm paraphrasing that doesn't make it false either because we have that desire or longing for God doesn't falsify it. But I think it's something that's sort of a you know symptom of our culture where you know you it's we live in a very a uh, time where it's sort of nihilistic or, you know, everything's just doom and gloom, everything is the end of the world, and, you know, there's no afterlife and there's no soul, and you can only have the material world. And so I think Francis Schaeffer did a great job uh, in his facts-value split, uh, sort of the two-story, you know, to describe our culture, I think we see through either facts or values in a postmodern culture and sort of a two-story building where at the the first level you have facts and you have the material world and you have all the things you can test and then values would be you know our sense of morality our desire for meaning and purpose and it is like our culture has pretended like this top level exists and we're fascinated by it and we want to go see the Avengers and we want to watch Star Wars and we want to talk about stories and imagination and all that but that's not nearly as real as the bottom level, which is facts in the material world. And so, for whatever reason, you know, it's, it's became one or the other, when in reality there should be an integrated perspective where we need facts in life. We, 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 we definitely need scientific fact. We need to study, you know, the world around us. But also values are just as real. Morality is just as real. Our you know, desire and longing for meaning is not a, uh, you know, evolutionary byproduct. It's it's something real that that does exist. And, uh, you know, maybe that kind of would put us in, you know, we may want to shift the conversation a little bit to postmodernism and what that is. Um, but, you know, capturing both of the facts and values in a sort of an, you know, we I, I like using the, the word integrated, an integrated approach, you know, um, to reason and imagination, you know, and, and how do we integrate the two and, uh, you know, kind of take take that approach, um, you know, to those two working together. Uh, so I think that's something that's important. And did you have something to add to that? I'm sorry, Carl. Uh, so what about, let's go to the postmodern, because so I keep using that word. For those who don't know what postmodernism is, Carla, maybe you can uh, describe postmodernism, you know, in a nutshell, or or Zach, either one of you, maybe you guys can describe what that is and kind of the state of our culture today. Um, I, you know, we, we say that word a lot, and I think a lot of people don't really have an idea of what that means. Zach, do you want to start? Sure. I mean, when I when I think of postmodernism, I think of a few um, I think of a few symptoms, if you will. Okay. Um, I I think of one symptom is the um, the kind of 
the acceptance of, I see, skepticism. Um, there's kind of this idea that there's no, there's no overarching objective truth. So it dials down into kind of skepticism of that existence, and then it falls into relativism. So your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth. Don't tell me my truth is wrong. My truth is just as valid as your truth, um, which stands in stark contrast to Christianity, where we look at, um, you know, we say, well, God's truth is truth, and we're trying to discover that. So, I mean, in a real nutshell, I think that's a really important tenet of um, postmodernism that's a challenge for Christians. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And how do we, how does cultural apologetics help us point people to objective truth? Well, I think one thing we have, I mean, it's a really um, commonly used argument in apologetics, but a lot of times um, when we have, when somebody you know, believes that their truth is the only truth, right? My truth is valid, or they believe that their truth is just as valid as any other truth. The interesting part about that is that they're making an objective claim themselves. They're making a claim about something that is absolutely true, that their truth is true. Right. And um, so it, it's kind of self-defeating. No one lives entirely consistently as a relativist. There's always some point yeah. where they will appeal to some objective truth. And so once they realize that they can't escape objective truth, then it's a question of helping them kind of define the collection, shall we say, yeah. of objective truths. Um, I was just going to add to that. The first class that uh, I had in the apologetics program, Zach was in my class. It was on film and uh, visual arts. And we had this conversation, uh, Zach and I, about because I said, I don't understand how someone can believe something and see the results, which are bad results, and think, okay, well, let's stop doing that and and <laughs> do something else. Right. And Zach's response is, well, they don't think there's a connection between that action and the result. Yeah. So they don't have to acknowledge that what they believe is wrong. That's a good point. And so really that postmodernism is actually anti-evidence and anti-truth anti as a whole, yeah. even science, when you have to deny what's in front of your face to hold on to that belief. And as, as you guys were talking, the thing that came to my mind was, and this is an, a real life example. Right. I, I live in North of Houston in Kingwood. And yeah. if anybody knows that outside the area where Kingwood is, it's because uh, we were underwater in Harvey and it mm. wasn't, it wasn't so much the rain. We handled the rain. It was because the um, river authority north of us handling the reservoir released at 79,000 cubic feet per second at two o'clock in the morning and wow. flooded people out. We had wow. 16,000 homes that flooded, 3,000 wow. businesses. And um, the thing about that is, is that there's so many things that play a role in that, that people have these ideas that I should be able to do whatever I want to do. Whatever yeah. I want to do, if it works for me, if it benefits me, I should be able to do it. And if you have the might, <laughs> then you have the right to do it. So they're holding the the hand on the lever to the gates. They the um, subdivisions around right on the the reservoir. There were only 150 that flooded. 150 versus 16,000 just in our area. And so they have they were able to open the gates and save theirs but there were a lot of people that were flooded out and some of them still aren't in their home. Wow. And so that is, that is factual evidence. Yeah. Do, is that a right, is that a right position to take? Yeah. Is this, is your personal right? Is, is it, sh should it exclude everything else? Yeah. And so, and that kind of goes to that same principle goes to abortion. Does your personal right override right everything else and that and that but that's true in multiple things not just that so i know people who straight up against abortion but they will take 
their property rights or their the rights in other areas and and think that it has higher value and is more right. important than someone hmm. else's and so yeah. are these ideas what what is the impact of these ideas and so if we can't look at the result of that and say you know what that's just really not working yeah you know, yeah then, and let's just maybe i have a wrong idea right but if you if you believe that well it's my truth then yeah, you know yeah. And you think that that's right, yeah. that you're never going to get past yeah. that point ever because yeah. we will always be these little islands. And sometimes those our islands going to step on somebody else's. Right. And like in the case of what we've been dealing with for the past two years, other people's islands are smashing yeah. us. Yeah. So, you know, it has a real world. These ideas have a real world. Yeah. Impact. No, that's that's a great way to put it. And I think everyone draws a line somewhere. And you, like you said, eventually our worlds collide where someone's preference is up against another person's preference. And you've got to decide what is the, you know, what is the truth? What is, the, you know, the right thing to do? And this, we get into these conversations about morals. And, um, and then we, we want to pretend like morality is some, you know, made up thing. Uh, but it's a God-given truth. It's God-given reality. It's it's something real. And I, w when you go to to watch the Avengers, you don't have to tell anyone in there who the bad guy is. Exactly. You know, you don't have to tell anyone who the good guys are. Exactly. And when you watch the you know the last two films, spoiler alert if you haven't seen if you haven't seen these by now, you need something's wrong with you. Uh, but <laughs> if you haven't seen the first one, Infinity War, it ends kind of melodramatically. It's, it's very or melancholy, it's it's very sad the way it ends. You don't have to tell anyone to feel sad. You don't have to tell anyone to feel like the good guys lost. Because finally they made, you know, a movie where it seems like the good guys, you know, lost in the end. But you don't have to have a religious course. You don't have to be a Christian. You don't have to have any of the things to go in there and have a sense of right and wrong. And I think the Bible really does advocate for that. It's just the word is written on our hearts. It's something in us that's there. We always have had this sense of morality. And up until the postmodern age, that really hadn't been, you know, called into question the way it is today, where it's like, you know, your truth takes precedence over anything. Um, but who's to say then that who's right or wrong and whose truth is the right one and you know, like you said, we see the effects of, of that. You know, you see this, uh, you know, I know this is the most extreme and commonly used example, but in, but in Hitler's regime, I mean, you see the effect. I mean, why, why can't we say that that's absolutely evil, that that's, you know, murdering six million Jews is absolutely evil, and we know that that's real, that's a real evil, and, and we can denounce that and say that it's objectively, there's no perspective about that, it's, it's, it's evil, you know, and I think that this is the role of a cultural apologet of apologetics, you know, layman is to, to, to explain, you know, through story or, you know, whatever. You don't have to necessarily watch a Christian film to get some concept of, of who, even who God is, because we have a sense for that that's in us. And I think we have a desire for that, that that's that's in us. I, I think the, the other thing about postmodernism is that if truth is relative to you, and it's not outside of yourself, right. then if someone says to you, okay, well, like you believe a certain thing and you say, okay, well, that's not true. It right. gives facts. They take it as a personal assault yeah. on themselves yeah. that you're attacking them. If you, uh, challenge their truth. Yeah. And so I, you know, I've been thinking about this in the past couple of days because from a, a few situations, but um, I think that part of this is, I think the church as itself needs to start making a change because if we as Christians who, also, who say that we believe in the same truth, that Jesus came and died for our sins and he rose again on the third day, if we can't if we can't believe, if we believe in the same God and we believe the same core things, if we can't have conversations among each other about other things like the, the side things that we disagree on, mm -hmm. then how can we expect anybody else to, how can we have those conversations with anyone else that right. 
doesn't believe the way that we do. Right. If, if we're supposed to model um, charity among each other yeah. and we don't, then why are we surprised that we have such a d- divisive culture yeah. where everyone is just like, if you don't agree with me in everything, yeah. you are damned to yeah. hell, you are absolutely yeah. evil. Yeah. You know, and so maybe we just have, we yeah. need to have a little bit of grace for other people. Like, you know what, right. maybe they have a perspective that they don't maybe either understand right. or heaven forbid, maybe right. I don't understand something. You know, we have to be able to learn how to have some humility yeah. about what we believe in and recognize that God is truth. It's outside of us. And so that we all come from a darkened understanding and we are approaching that truth and hopefully bring some other people with us. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we see this a lot. You know, um, I think people now, it's, it's easy to just label someone as something. Call them something and label them as that. That way you don't have to have a conversation. You don't have to talk about ideas. You know, if we shout each other down, if we write each other off, and this is on... You know, where, wherever people fall politically, you, you can see this on the fringes of the right or the left or whatever you want to call it. You see this, the farther out you get, this, these two are actually kind of similar to each other in that they, you know, will, uh, you know, shout each other down, write each other off instead of, and I, I think that there is something in us that wants to have a conversation. I think people really want to believe in something that they've, thought about it. I think there is that desire in us and if you if you just do what it's your preference you're never going to kind of heal or touch that that desire that you have for something of substance in your life and I don't th- I don't see how you can do that in a postmodern world if you just say well you know I I believe this and this is what I'm going to do and you know without any sort of substance or weight to it and I know there are a lot of people who live that, like that I just don't know how satisfied they are with their lives you know, and I think it is our role to shed some light in the world and some truth in the world. Um, here's something to kind of uh, kind of hit on. I was thinking about the cultural apologetics approach, and I have a, a younger nephew, and I don't always know how to relate to the next up and coming, the screen generation. I mean, they, when you look at a anyone, I guess, below the age of, you know, 14 today, and, and also upward, but, but especially that really younger age, they have a screen in their hand all the time. You know, they're always looking at a phone, they're always on an iPad, they're always on a computer, and I know a lot of parents are discouraged because they don't know what to do with that. I don't know necessarily what to do with that. Um, so, if we're, and I, I remember, I, you know, put it this way, not to, not to just, deem all those those uh, screen watchers as terrible, terrible people and they're, they're irredeemable. But I remember the, the comparison between Huxley's uh, Brave New World and George Orwell's 1984. And Huxley made the claim that Big Brother's not going to have to come in and take all the books. We're going to just stop reading books. The libraries would just be emptied out on their own. So what do we do to establish, I mean, because books, long-form conversations, this is, seems to be the only way to establish well thought out beliefs. So how do we reach the screen generation, you know, that maybe won't pick up a book and, you know, can we re-inspire them? Are they just a lost cause or, you know, how do we do this now? I think that um, a lot of it is there's a detachment between generations and a lot of the rhetoric that you see online, it's like uh, condemning, you know, certain young, younger generations. And I think that we, we do have to see them as, you know, these are people in training. You know, yeah. they're they're a human being that God has a special plan for. Yeah. And it's not just the kids. Yeah. Yes, they are completely attached to it, but it's also the adults. So there's a separation yeah. between adults and, and the generations in between and the younger ones. And so I think it's important to have those connections you know, connections apart from social media. So, you know, going out and doing activities and just spending time and we can say, okay, the kids are, you know, have a a phone growing out of their hand, but what are adults doing that's any different? So I think, you know, it has to start, if it's something that um, you're concerned about, is like, you know, having that connection with, 
with um, with a younger person, right. especially if you're not related to them. Right. You know, if if it's somebody that you're around that, I mean, there's a lot of there's not a lot of teaching, like one on one teaching. So they go on YouTube to learn how to right. do things. So you know, if you know how to do something, say, hey, can you come help me and yeah. teach somebody a practical skill yeah. so they don't have to you know go out or yeah. you know just explore or share something that yeah. you know that you like. I mean, it's that one on one connection. Yeah, I was actually. Um, doing some research on empathy and imagination mm -hmm. and uh the last is from 2000 so basically the last 20 years empathy has just tanked. yeah and they connect it to social media and and online games too because there's it's the people even though there's a real person behind the screen they seem less real right and so they don't really care so we need to start Reversing that and yeah. having those actual one on one connections. Yeah. Having talks, you know, having going and doing activities. Yeah. You know, going and and um actually exploring nature and, and meeting your neighbors. Yeah. Like literally we don't meet our neighbors until the lights go out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so yeah. you know, think about it, like especially like when we had Harvey hit, I mean this can happen with anything. Right, you know? right. That's great. Exactly. If if you don't have you rely so much on your phone, well what if you can't access your you know, what if your right. phone's dead? I mean right. have like know your neighbors, know their names, you know, yeah. Go have their actual you know, know who lives in your yeah, street. Yeah. I mean, have um block parties or something i mean yeah. just having a connection and community i think that yeah. that helps yeah yeah i think uh you know that's that's a fear of the screen generation is losing the ability to have face-to-face -face conversation and have you know talking to your neighbors or when i was a kid you know i spent a lot of time outside you know and that's where the imagination comes into play is we didn't have the screen the virtual world to make any world we wanted you had to imagine that world and uh you know i i do fear that we're losing a sense of that ability to be imaginative and um you know i i think there you point out some great ways to retain that in the future because you don't want to just say ah uh, you know this generation is doing it differently than i did so they're all you know they're wrong that's that's always sort of a temptation for the older generation to just say, okay, well, that's not the way we did it. It doesn't work. They may be better than us in, in certain areas, uh, but I just hope we never lose that ability to be imaginative because uh, the imagination is so important. And I think we'll always have that. It's just a human, a human, uh, you know, just part of being human is having the imagination. But the imagination can be used for good or evil. It can be a tool for, for, for evil in life. I mean, uh, you know, so it, it's, it's something that we have to be, you know, careful of uh, guarding that imagination and guarding where we allow our creativity to go, um, because some of the most evil, you know, masterminds were really, really creative. Um, and so, uh, you know, having a healthy exercise of the imagination, you know, is really, really important. Um, so, you know, another thing too, this is where I. I question and I worry, you know, the state of the church intellectually. Um, where are we right now? Uh, because it's important that we equip people to defend the gospel, to defend their Christian faith. Uh, and one thing I've I've experienced, and maybe you guys have experienced this too, um, you start talking about defending the faith. You start talking about philosophy. You start talking about this. In some Christian circles, you're going to get some pushback. It's almost that people don't want to engage in intellectual conversation in the place where we need to do it most. I think the, the church should be a place where we answer tough questions and difficult questions. So, uh, and Zach, maybe you have an opinion on this, but what is the, what is the intellectual state of the church? Uh, are we suffering from, you know, sort of an, you know, we, we, we kind of put things on, you, you walk into some churches now and uh, you wouldn't know the difference between that and just, you know, motivational speech or, you know, <laughs> So where are we at, and how do we how do we reshift? Sure. Well, I yeah. First of all, I do not think that our um, our intellectual stage is very good. So I'll just start there. Um, but I think it comes from two um, well from two main areas. Uh, number one, I think that uh, there is just our own laziness. First of all, I think um, 
like we've been talking about here in the past, the last conversation about screen time, um, we like things right now, we like them easy, we like them convenient. And I mean, let's face it, the not every issue in the Bible is simple. Um, we think about, I mean, the book of Job is probably one of my favorite books. Um, I think that is the book of Acts, but Job is a really tough book. I mean, he's wrestling with big, huge life issues, and it's not really the thing that you can find on BuzzFeed for your answer. I mean, it's not going to happen that way. And, you know, a 500-word article isn't going to be like, okay, and Job was suffering because X. I mean, it's a lot more complicated than that. And so I do think our laziness is one. uh, We're not always ready to do our homework, to sit down, to try to wrestle these things out because, I mean, they certainly take time. Um, I think the other challenge to the intellectual state of the church right now is we're, we're kind of I mean, we're kind of afraid, I think. And I think we're afraid that, you know, if I, uh, I'm not a parent, but I imagine parents feel this way, is, you know, if I, um, you know, show my kid that there might be a question about Christianity, then, you know, oh, no, like, what will that lead to? And what will that lead to? And, oh, no, uh, they're, they're gone. Um, and, you know, I, I, I recognize that fear, and I think, I think most parents probably have that fear if they raise their kids in the church. Um, but that being said, I mean, unfortunately, the, the children are even, I mean, men, I know people my age who have these same questions, and they don't have anyone that they're able to talk to about it. I mean, I've, yeah. and I'm, I mean, what, I'm 27. I mean, I'm, I have plenty of people my age who are still wrestling with these issues because they haven't found answers. Um, and yet, if we're not willing to engage and just say, um, yeah, and just kind of say, well, yeah, you don't have to understand that. You don't have to, you know, wrestle with that. Just trust. And I'm all for trusting God. So I, I'm going to be, um, at the same time, I think we need to give people ways to think about their faith that, um, you know, kind of help them reconcile some of these difficult parts. And they might not have all the answers. Some answers we just won't know all the time. We're not, we're not God. We're not going to know everything. Um, but we need to at least show people that we're not afraid to question. We're not afraid to look at it. And a lot of questions really do have answers in the pages of scripture in, and also, I mean, in the world around us, like, I mean, this whole time we've been talking we've been talking about truth and I mean, we haven't cited very many Bible verses, but at the same time, we're talking about God's truth. Um, right. Because of what we see revealed in the world around us, it's that whole, you know, in Romans 1, where it's evident, and then some people suppress the truth. Um, so it's not, um, you know, I think that those are the two main things that really, um, the intellectual state of the church. Number one, we do get lazy, we get complacent, we run it easy. And number two, sometimes we're just afraid. So we may want to help, but we don't want to do it wrong. We don't want to send our kid into, you know, rebellion. So we just avoid talking about things, kind of shush the questions and move on. Right, yeah. I think that's true, especially the fear. So people are afraid, well, if I question and if I look for the answer, what if I find out that what I believe is <laughs> yeah. true? And, you know, yeah. I would have to I'd have to say that it's been, the thing about this, this program, it was so... First of all, it's fun, but it, right. it also it so strengthens your faith from oh, yes. so many different areas. And so, you know, if you are seeking truth, then you don't have anything to be afraid of. Right. Because the truth is go- just going to lead you into a fuller understanding right. of who God is. Um, so I think I think that's one thing. I was talking to a friend of mine and she said, I think their daughter, her oldest daughter was like eight or nine at the time. And they were talking about the Bible. And she said, her daughter said, well, how do we know this is true? Mm -hmm. And she, she was upset about it because she just said, you know, she's, she's nine. Like you should just believe at this point. And, (laughs) And I said, well, you don't, it's okay to have questions. Yeah. It's okay to have questions. And so God made her to be looking for answers and wanting right. to have the reasons. And so you can have these conversations yeah. with her. And then 
when she gets older and her friends start having, when everybody else starts to have the same questions, she's going to be able to help them. Right. So I, I know that like, especially in Texas, we have a lot of homeschooling and I think that's great. I think it's that people can do it. Um, sometimes it's because it's for the, that's just the best thing for their child at the time. But sometimes, and this, this isn't always the case, but sometimes I think it's out of fear. Yeah. Because they're fear of other influences. And I just have to say that unless you're like the Chirpins and try to lock your children away from all outside influences, it's going to happen. They're going to see those questions. And so I think that it's, if you have the opportunity to have those, those conversations with your kids as they come up, then you know, you're there to be part of the conversation. So one of my daughters is, um, she's had, she's been best friends with Mormons since she was in kindergarten. Yeah. And so all these questions come up. Well, what's different between what they believe and what we believe? Mm -hmm. And how do you explain the Trinity? And Mm -hmm. how do we know that this is true? And so she's had, and this is a true story. So she has one of her, uh, one of her best friends from there in kindergarten. They were in high school and, um, and this friend is a Mormon. And so they're sitting in the locker room at their public high school and she and her friend are having this debate about the Trinity Uh and sitting around them is a Muslim, an atheist and a Jew and they're, and they're listening to her and her friend debate the Trinity. Yeah. And so yeah, and she said, well, I like Soraya because she's fun to argue with. Yeah. Because there's yeah. very few people you can have strong discussions with, you know. And so right. I, if if you just wait until, you know, try to keep them in a cocoon. Right. And not know that there's people who believe differently. Right. Then they can get to, you're not always going to have them wrapped up in a bundle. Right. They're going to get out and they're going to go, what is yeah, this and yeah. not know how to handle it. Yeah. So um, I would say, you know, when those things come up, take it as an opportunity to be able to explain those things. But it takes work. Yes. It's, it takes yeah. work. So you're, you're not going to learn those, those that information or those yeah. facts sitting, sitting and watching Game yeah. of Thrones. Yeah. You're going to have to do <laughs> the studying, and there's a lot more that, I mean, they're bombard, bombarded by a lot of things. Absolutely. So it's... It's going to be, as a parent, it's a continual learning thing. And you have to learn how to have conversations without getting defensive about, because they'll just ask whatever, you know, I mean, I I teach a third grade Sunday school class and there's no filter. I mean, they just, whatever comes to their head, it it comes up, but you know, it it helps you as you work through it. And sometimes for me, I have to write it before I can verbalize it, you know, Clearly. Yeah. And yeah. so, and if that's what it takes for somebody and, yeah. and somebody has a question, just write it down and research and say, and say, okay, well, let's look at this. What do, what do people have to say? Because the answers are there. We have yeah. so much, yeah. there's yeah. so much out there and that so much, so many resources. I mean, there's really, there's nothing, there's nothing yeah. to be afraid of. Yeah. Like when you're establishing what actually is. Yeah. Doing. Yeah. I remember um, in, in, in undergraduate, sort of my personal story to this, kind of attest to what you're saying. Um, I was in a religion class, and I told them that I enjoyed studying apologetics, and I enjoyed, and there was an, another Christian in the class, and, and he said, well, that's not faith. That needing reasons is not faith. And I said, yes, it, it absolutely is faith. Uh, it may not be necessarily blind faith, but it's it's it's... It's faith, because faith is trusting God, it's trusting in Him, and trusting that if I ask these questions, they're not going to come back with, you know, uh, answers that discount God. I believe He exists so much that I'm willing to have the conversation with whoever, or answer the questions, because I have that much faith in Him, I'm willing to ask these questions. I think there is sort of a almost lack of faith in those that who are scared to ask the questions because it seems like they're they're scared they're going to be proven wrong and i have no fear that what i've experienced with god and my relationship with god is absolutely real and so i don't have any fear of putting it on the line because i'm not afraid it's going to come back void and i think that's so important for us as apologists um you know to be able to to explain to those who maybe 
hesitancy to or hesitant to study apologetics. This is why you should, and I think you should, especially the next generation, they probably more than ever are going to be faced with these questions, and we should equip them uh, with the answers. Uh, we are a little pressed for time. Before we get out of here, uh, Zach, you are, you're studying at Faulkner U. You're getting your PhD in Humanities. Um, and uh, just wanted to plug a few things. I know you also uh, do some writing for Desirable Ends and then an unexpected journal. So what all are you up to? How can people find you? Um, tell us what, what's what's going on in Zach's world right now. Sure, yeah. So, um, yeah, and first of all, man, thanks for having us. This has been great. It's been a lot of fun. And, um, yeah, so I do, um, I try to segment my writing because the fields don't always overlap very well. So, uh, like you mentioned, I do write for an unexpected journal. That's my primary project. Um, and we have a new issue coming out. Uh, next week, hopefully, if yeah. everything, uh, that's the plan right now, um, and uh, we're really excited about that. I think it's going to be great. Um, I do write for a website called Desirable Ends. A friend and I at Faulkner started it. It's a bit more political for your listeners who enjoy conservative political talk, um, and I do just have my own personal website, which... I started as a class project um, at HBU, actually. Um, it's called Entering the Public Square. It's a lot of, um, it's it's more cultural apologetic, shall we say. I try to lean in that direction more. Um, I try to segment myself so people can find me where I'm at. But yeah, it's a lot of fun. Great, great. Uh, man, it is, it's been a pleasure having you on too. Um, you know, it's our first time to formally meet, but it's, it's been a pleasure to, to have you on. Uh, Carla, I know you do some writing as well, and uh, I know you contribute to an unexpected journal. You help Zach in a lot of ways with that, um, and I know you uh, have a website. Is it RaceToWalk.org? Yeah, RaceToWalk.org, and that's basically um, it's about the Christian faith. Okay. So I, I write mainly to Christians. Cool. And so um, that's where I write. I write it in an unexpected journal. Okay. And. Um, when I get my essays together with all the, the publishing stuff. So, yeah, it's fun. Great. It's been a, been a lot of fun. Great. Awesome. Well, uh, you know, looking forward to what both you guys have coming in the future. Um, you know, we've we've rubbed shoulders here at HBU, uh, but it's, it's really neat to see you guys both pioneering your own projects. And so uh, hopefully people can, can look into that more in Unexpected Journal and RaceToWalk.org. Uh, so yeah, looking forward to what you guys are up to in the future. I appreciate you guys sitting down and having this conversation with me. Uh, it's been it's been entertaining and it's also been uh, very very much uh, encouraging. So I'm I'm looking forward to what what's coming in the future for both of you. So thanks again. Thanks for having us. I appreciate it. All right, thank you. Hey guys, so we just finished up the interview with Carla Alvarez and Zach Schmoll. Uh, thank you for watching. Thank you for. Uh, your time and your attention. We hope that we gave some insight as to what cultural apologetics is, how we can defend Christianity in today's world. Hopefully that helped you or benefited you in some way. And as always, thank you for your support.